I'm Ez Devlin. We are in London. It's a beautiful spring day. Blossoms are emerging. I wish I were with you in New York, but we'll do our best from here. Do you know, interestingly, the invitation which led to the project Come Home Again outside the Tate Modern last September was in fact an invitation to consider making a portrait of London. That was the brief. And I considered who is London, who are Londoners. There are 15,000 species of Londoner, of which humans are one. And actually, the biodiversity of cities is perhaps even more urgent to preserve. And if we can't preserve the remaining species of which we are one fifteen thousandth of, then we're not going to uh, have much hope of protecting them from extinction. What we really need artists to do is to create habitats for these species within the human imagination. Because if we don't have a habitat for these species within the human imagination, then the prospects for them remaining unextinct are really challenging. And it seemed to me that every time you learn the name of a species other than human, you make a room for it in your imagination. You rewire your imagination. You make a house for it within the memory palace of your mind. So that was really the, the instinct that led to the piece. It's interesting, when you start to draw animals, when you start to really engage in species and animals that are not human, and you start to observe them, something surprising happens to the edges of yourself, in that you become more porous in a way, and you start to recognize the symmetry between the systems within your own hand that's drawing, and the systems within the animal or the species of plant that you're drawing. So as you draw, veins in a leaf, as you draw veins on a bat's wing, as you draw the veins on the sort of diaphanous wing of a, of a fly, you are aware of the veins coursing with the blood that reaches your fingers that allows you to even draw. The project itself then was very specific in its location. The Tate Modern was of course a seat of industrial power, an industrial power station sitting across the River Thames from St. Paul's Cathedral, a seat of ancient ecclesiastical power. And then, of course, the reason why both of those edifices are, are even there and why London is here is because of the river, this coursing planetary artery. So the piece ended up being uh, a conversation between those seats of power across this artery of, of planetary power. And then for 10 days, we sung, even song every night, and the animals sung as well. So we had recorded voices of some of these 250 species. And by the final night, 7,000 people turned up. I mean, it was surprising how much it caught people's imagination just to be part of a ritual. The audience is a temporary society. They gather together in the dark and they come in as one group of people. And if we work correctly among them while they're with us, then they emerge as changed people. There's the possibility for that at least. It's a really rare thing now to be part of an audience. No phones, no fragmentation, potentially an hour and a half of unfragmented attention of a group of people together in the dark stimulated only by one thing. And yet, through all this pretense and artifice, truth can be told, perspectives can be shifted. My feeling is that the skills that I've been honing instinctively over the last 30 years, working with these temporary communities in dark spaces, may be of some use now, as we instinctively are drawn towards more ritual forms of art, I think. Well, if you think about the broader history of what ritual was, people would gather in every kind of culture. They would sing together, they would share 
texts and words and vocabularies together, they would share lights, architecture, scent, incense, music. And this was as much part of being a human as eating or procreating or anything else we might do. That's just being human. And one might say that this last sort of 500 years, since the enclosure not only of the land or, you know, ever more of people's imagination, is kind of an aberration from that. The idea that one would enclose the scent of the incense in a ritual temple or space and sell it as perfume. The idea that one would enclose the music, commit it to plastic or magnetic tape and sell that. The idea that you'd enclose the art, the frescoes, the stained glass windows, put them in a white art gallery and sell them and commodify them all. Isolate, separate, silo, commodify. You might look back at this period of history and say, wow, that was weird. <laughs> what were they doing? Why were they doing this selling thing? How could they possibly have thought that any of the materials of the planet could have been commodities to be bought? And so what was that all about? So I guess this instinct towards collective sharing, what it means to exchange and transfer stories, energies, ideas, feelings that aren't for sale. You will feel like this when you're sitting amongst 7,000 people singing with other London species. And you get to take that away, you don't have to pay. Because that's what we do, because we're human. I wonder if maybe more art and design will be in the interest of being human rather than commodifying or making money perhaps in, in the long run. You know, as designers, we are brilliant at working within parameters. You know, we work in parameters of space, we work in parameters of time, we work in parameters of budget. You know, what will happen to these materials when the project is over, if it's an ephemeral project? If it's a permanent and lasting project, you know, where is the budget for the carbon? So it's a case of adding this extra parameter, which has always been there. It's just been ignored. The parameter is the planet. And it needs to be on that register, along with all the others, as a budget. I think it's going to be designers that lead that themselves, rather than those who commission the projects. That's what we do. 